Presbyterian Church on July 5th, 2020, as we celebrate our second in-person worship since March 8th. Uh, but we are still recording the service for those who want to participate online and are unable to join us here in person. I'm Scott Lennon, the pastor here at Stone Church. I'm joined again by our music director, Bob Culp, uh, and our videographer, of course, Helen Leonard, my wife, uh, and Laura Lynn will be joining us today for a solo, I believe. And we also, oh, she's not today, so okay, she's, she's on next week, we'll leave more on that week. And very uh, want to welcome our special guest today, uh, the Reverend Kate Dunn from the Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church in New York, New York, uh, Ann Dunn's daughter, uh, and well, Paul's as well. Um, <laughs> she uh, normally preaches to, uh, she does preach to several hundred people, so this is a little bit of a change, you know, for her, a change up for her and a blessing for us here today. So she'll be giving the sermon today and assisting me as liturgist. For those watching online, our bulletin is on the Facebook site, as it has been, and on our website if you want to follow along with our responses. But it's also fine just to watch and enjoy. And we will not be singing again today, but we'll ask you to meditate on the verse as Rob will play the first verse that we have for each hymn, as you see in your bulletin. We've gathered here to praise God, so now let us return to God, opening ourselves in His presence. Come bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. May the Lord, maker of heaven and earth, bless you from Zion. For the Lord it is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let us Let's worship, worship God. God.
here is the truth, that through no action of our own God has chosen to show his mercy on us, that Christ was born and lived as one of us, and that in his death, through the mystery of God's mercy, he rose again so that all sin might be forgiven. Thanks be to God. In these times of uncertainty and stress, we as followers of Christ know a peace that surpasses understanding. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also, also with you. Let us share the peace with one another from where we are by sign and smile. And as I say, you can't see a person smile in their eyes. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh Lord, your word is upright and by your word were the heavens and earth created. May the words we are about to hear rest in hearts and turn ourselves to you. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. After two harrowing stories from the past two Sundays, the near deaths of both Ishmael and Isaac, in today's passages from Genesis 24, we have a love story of sorts, a story that has been foreshadowed already in the account of the sacrifice of Isaac. Abraham sends his servant to find a wife for his son Isaac in his home country. The servant finds a woman at a well, Rebekah, who is gracious and kind. But what appears to be a simple account of an arranged marriage turns out to be the intersection of several faith journeys. Listen now for that story. The man said to Laban, Rebekah's brother, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has greatly blessed my master, and he has become wealthy. He has given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, male and female slaves, camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old. And he has given him all that he has. My master made me swear, saying, You shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I live. But you shall go to my father's house, to my kindred, and get a wife for my son. I, I, I came today to the spring and said, O oh Lord, O oh God of Abraham, if now you will only make me successful the way that I am going. I'm standing here by a spring of water. Let the young woman who comes to draw, to whom I shall say, please give me a little water from your jar to drink and who will say to me, Drink, and I will draw for your camels also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. Before I had finished speaking in my heart, there was Rebecca coming with her water jar on her shoulder, and she went down to the spring and drew and I said to her, Please let me drink. She quickly let the jar down from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I will also water your camels. So I drank. And she also watered the camels. Then I asked her, Whose daughter are you? She said, The daughter of Bethel. Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore to him. So I put my ring on her nose and bracelets on her arms. Then I bowed my head and worshipped the Lord and blessed the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me the right way to obtain a daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. 
Now then, if you will deal loyally and truly with my master, tell me. And if not, tell me, so that I may turn either to the right hand or to the left. And they called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? She said, I will. So they went away, they sent her away, uh, their sister Rebekah, and her nurse along with Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, May you, our sister, become thousands of myriads. May your offspring gain possession of the gates of their foes. Then Rebekah and her maids rose up, mounted camels, and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebekah and went his way. Now Isaac had come from Baraloi and was settled in Negro. Isaac went out in the evening to walk in the field. And looking up, he saw camels coming. And Rebekah looked up, and when she saw Isaac, she slipped quickly from the camel and said to the servant, Who is that man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. She took her veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent. He took Rebekah, and she became his wife. And he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Word of the Lord. Last week's reading from Romans was from Romans 6, and this week, uh, the lesson from Romans 7 also features Paul's teaching on the tension between and struggle between life in the spirit and life in the flesh. These readings signify the difficulty of embracing the faithful life and living out the Christian identity. In other words, the question Paul raises is this, how can a Christian live an obedient life that becomes an expression of living faith? Listen as the Apostle Paul addresses that. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law, that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God and my inmost self. But I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is my song, O oh God.
Matthew persistently affirms in his gospel that God's empire, embodied in the proclamation and teaching of Jesus, brings both judgment and salvation, both healing and division. Jesus' teachings in these two passages from Matthew 11 illumine the dynamics of this division, focusing especially on the failure of those who have witnessed Jesus' ministry to respond and on the success of his ministry among the most vulnerable. Listen to these words of lament and thanks from Jesus. But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplace, calling to one another, we played our flute and, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came, neither eating nor drinking. And they say, he has a demon. The Son of Man came, eating and drinking. And they say, look, a glutton, a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such is your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by the Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Son, the Father except the Son, and all those to whom the, Father, the Son reveals. Come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The word of the Lord. Before I begin, I just want to thank you all for having me here today. I grew up in Clinton and must have walked by this church thousands of times, often on my way to the cinema where I worked when it was a 99 cent theater. And I did the concession stand for quite some time, clean the theater. Um, so it's always been uh, just a lovely um, thing to walk in the village and walk by this church. And I didn't know I was going to be a pastor. I had no idea that I would ever preach here, so it is really lovely to be here, so thank you for having me. Do you remember how you played when you were a child? Did you have favorite games like hide and seek, or capture the flag, or Monopoly, or Candyland? Did you have an imaginary friend? Did you play with blocks, or a dollhouse, or superheroes, or cars, or Legos, or Plato, did you play Let's Pretend and Make Believe? Did you build forts out of all the living room furniture? Did you climb trees? Spend hours on a playground? When you think about those times, how do you feel? For me, memories of childhood play evoke feelings of being safe, happy, engaged, I can also remember feelings of frustration when the games didn't go the way I wanted. I wanted to play tag, but you wouldn't chase me. I wanted to play school, but you wouldn't let me be the teacher. Researchers have been telling us for years now about the importance of play and nurturing healthy children so that they grow into healthy adults. 
When playing, children learn to make independent choices and experience the consequences of those choices. They learn how to regulate their feelings and maintain self-control so that other children will keep playing with them. They learn to experiment, to try things out, to be flexible in their thinking. Most important, when children play, they have fun, which enlivens and rejuvenates them and gives them the resilience they need to grow into healthy, creative, engaged adults. This morning's passage begins somewhat playfully with Jesus offering an image of children quarreling. Some want to play weddings. Some want to play funeral, and the others won't go along, and so they all end up sitting in the marketplace arguing. Anyone who has spent any amount of time around children will have witnessed such scenes. And if adults can restrain themselves from getting involved long enough to let the children work it out, they usually do, because ultimately, they all want to play. Just before today's scripture, John the Baptist, who was in prison, sent his disciples to ask Jesus if he was the one they were waiting for. And Jesus responded, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. And now, here is this generation taking offense, arguing like children, criticizing how the message is delivered, letting themselves be distracted from the message itself, that the realm of God is at hand, and the sick are being healed, and the poor are receiving good news. Jesus continues with these mysterious words, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. What in the world is Jesus talking about? What do infants see that we can't see? Maybe we can get some help from one of the Christian mystics. The woman we now know as Saint Therese of Lisieux was born on January 2nd, 1873, the last of nine children. From a young age, she felt called to religious life and entered the convent at age 15. There she lived a short, quiet, cloistered life and died of tuberculosis at age 24. We only know about her because her superiors in the convent recognized but she had a mystical connection to God, and they ordered her to write about her life. After her death, the convent shared these writings called The Story of a Soul, and Therese's reputation for holiness spread. Within 30 years, she was canonized as a saint of the Catholic Church. This would have made her very happy, because Therese said she always wanted to be a saint. In her writings, Therese quotes this passage I just read about God hiding things from the wise and intelligent and revealing them to infants. She writes, God wished to manifest God's mercies through me. Just because I was so little and so frail, God stooped to me and taught me gently the secrets of divine love. She describes these secrets as the little way. I will find a little way to heaven, very short and direct, an entirely new way, like an elevator, she said. Elevators had just been invented, and Therese wrote that Jesus would take her in his arms and carry her to heaven like an elevator, because she was too little to climb all the stairs. The little way involves infusing love into our smallest interactions, into every little thing we do. Trusting that the little things are just as important as the big things. 
the little way means accepting that we are imperfect and have so much to learn from God. And that is wonderful because God loves us exactly as we are and wants to teach us everything that we need to know. The little way involves cultivating a practice of spiritual childhood, striving to be like an infant in relation to God, accepting our absolute dependence on God. This is not a practice of becoming childish, but childlike, open, wondering, curious, playful, trusting. In a poem which she may have addressed to her four siblings who died young, Therese writes, O oh, innocence, to try on earth to be as small, that I will do, to be a child. The Lord asks me to mirror all that's seen in you. Help me, those charming things which in a child one sees, your openness, your lovely innocence, your total trust, all these. May I possess. Later in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The need to become like children is a theme that runs through scripture. It's obviously important. And I'll be honest, there's something about this idea that terrifies me. Yes, there are many wonderful things about childhood, but children don't have much power or control over their lives. Infants don't have any power or control. To become like a child, like an infant again, we'd have to give up all our power and control. Who feels safe enough to do that? I don't. Yet, when I remember how much fun it was to play when I was a child, I get the urge to play again now, and I wonder, is that what God wants? For adults to feel safe enough to play like children, even if that means some quarreling in the marketplace while we figure out how to play so everyone can participate? And then Jesus says, come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. There's a reason that this line of scripture speaks so deeply to our hearts. We carry burdens. Maybe we carry burdens of debt, illness, depression, hunger, addiction, rage, grief, estrangement, worry. Maybe we carry the burden of fear, fear of not being able to provide financially or emotionally for people we love, fear of separation from loved ones, fear for our own physical safety or the safety of someone we love. We all carry burdens, though sometimes, probably often, we cannot see the burdens that our neighbors carry. And sometimes we choose not to see the burdens that others carry. In the virtual gathering of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, which took place a couple of weeks ago, person after person shared stories about living with the burden of poverty. It was hard to watch. There were stories of eviction and homelessness, of families living in cars, parents raising children in homes without running water, people working for decades full time for minimum wage or more, or full time or more for minimum wage and barely making enough to pay rent, people having to choose between food and medicine, parents having to tell their children that no, there isn't anything to eat. In 2018, there were 11.9 million children living in poverty in this country. With numbers so big, it's hard to see the faces behind them. 
That's why the Poor People's Campaign is such a vital movement right now. It's showing us the faces of people living in poverty. It's telling us that it is time for the poor to have good news brought to them. Because all children deserve a childhood that it is safe enough for them to play. And it is hard for children who are hungry to play. It's hard for children who are living in cars or homeless shelters to play. It's hard for children whose parents work two or three jobs to pay the rent to play. It's hard for children who are sick because of lead in the water or pollutants in the air to play. It's hard for children who don't feel safe to play. It's hard for 11.9 million children in this country to play. And play is so important for children. Not being able to play is too heavy a burden for any of our children to bear. What do we do? Where do we start? Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Don't we want rest for our souls? Don't we need that? One thing we know for sure, our children need it. So let's pretend. Let's make believe that we are a young ox and we have absolutely no idea how to pull a plow. And let's pretend that amazingly we get to be yoked to Jesus, who knows exactly what he's doing and who carries the weight of our burdens and guides us in the right direction, and all we need to do is walk beside him and let him be our teacher. Or let's try to res his little way. Let's try as a spiritual discipline to do every little thing we do in a spirit of love. Every little thing. Every little text, every little email, every little chore, every little word. Trusting that God loves little things, let's imagine ourselves as little children, little enough to be carried, little enough to be cared for completely by God, little enough to play. Maybe our play will inspire the creativity and concentration and trust we need to all work together so that all of our children, all of God's children, have every little thing they need. On May 7th of this year, on the Interfaith Day of Prayer, Marianne Wright Edelman, founder of the Children's Defense Fund, offered this prayer, which I invite you to pray with me now. O oh God, Strengthen our hope for our children's sake. Strengthen our courage for our children's sake. Strengthen our discipline for our children's sake. Strengthen our ability to work together for our children's sake. Strengthen our spirit of sacrifice for our children's sake. Strengthen our faith in thee for our children's sake. We ask these things in these most difficult days and in all the days to come, that we might build a nation and world where all children are safe, healthy, loved, and justice abounds. Amen.
Welcome again for worshiping with us here today. Uh, we want to thank again Kate for joining us here from Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church and a joy to have her back in her home community uh, and hopefully her parents will be able to see her on if I can upload the video this week. It's always a uh, you know, pray for me I guess I'll say. Uh, uh, the fair trade shop and the farmers market's been going uh, pretty well I think so we're very pleased with that, that the community can be opened. And we will have during the course of uh, July, August, uh, St. James uh, out there giving away some painted rocks uh, for uh, donations for the Country Food Pantry. And the League of Women Voters will have a, a little table set up to encourage people to register for voting, uh, nonpartisan. So again, uh, all of us participating in our community life as, as we can. We did have this week, I mentioned it last week, I think, a young man, <clears throat> well, the most young these days, um, Jonathan Banks came up from Northern Pennsylvania doing research on Jonathan Edwards the Younger. And I happened to have a chance to come down and him and Mitch spent a couple of hours downstairs. He's doing, uh, you know, first source review of trying to find things we've got from 200 years ago uh, about what was going on. I'm very pleased with what he found and took some pictures and was head of the Hamilton College in New Hartford, uh, you know, as well. So he was very pleased, and we were very pleased to be part of that. And I told him, let us know when you get your research done, let us know, because, you know, we want to brag about being part of that, if you will. So very pleased about that. Uh, Kevin Lawson and Patty, uh, his wife, are uh, here basically for the month. Uh, Gene Lawson's, uh, Gene and Wilma Lawson's uh, uh, son and daughter-in-law. and. Right now we are planning for uh, August 1st, Saturday, August 1st uh, memorial service for Gene here, uh, here at Stone. And again, all things being equal, we're actually going to make a call an audible the week before, and you know, things might change. But provided things go well, we hope to have a memorial service then. So don't have a time set up yet. I've got the day blocked out, but probably the morning they're looking about having maybe refreshments or can we or can't we. So just in general, so that you're aware uh, for that. Uh, again, it was, it, it was lovely to have a, a Kate do the sermon for me because that takes up a fair amount of my time. Uh, and last night I went to bed early until my wife woke me up about an hour later she had gone into the other bedroom because there's a skunk smell coming in through the window. And in the other room, though, she found there was a bat. So we then spent time getting the bat out of the house. And the bat refused to go down the stairs. So uh, it would have made an interesting video to see. Um, so no rest for the weary, I guess. And you get a pool skimmer. Right, I had to get a pool skimmer and a dust thing and keep batting them down uh, so he could finally go down the stairs and, and out the door. So, and we've had birds in here as well, so I had that a few weeks ago, so. We live in the country. Uh, also wanna be, uh, for joys and concerns, we're very thankful. We have a, uh, a thank you thing from Presbyterian and Church USA, Presbyterian Mission for our one great hour of sharing which was uh, $665 that we donated, uh, which I think is fantastic considering that there's only four of us here on Palm Sunday at Bill to collect us. I'm very grateful for all of you to continue to, uh, you know, with the offerings and, and all of that. Are there any other, besides obviously, uh, I know Ann is overjoyed to have Kate down here uh, visiting and Paul. Uh, any other joys or concerns of anyone here in the sanctuary? Yes, Lana. I have a friend who um, lives in Florida. Uh, her husband recently she has been diagnosed with cancer, uh, and she would like prayers for him. And then in the same email, she told me that her brother is dying of cancer. So uh, her name is Linda. All right, so a friend of yours, Linda in Florida, her brother's dying of cancer, and her husband, and her husband has cancer. Certainly want to keep keep them in our keep them in our prayers. Any other uh, joys or concerns? 
Uh, then with that is speaking with the, uh, for the offering. Uh, the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. All that we have, we have from the Lord. And all that we have belongs to the Lord. So let us return a portion of what we have to the Lord to praise his name. So I'll ask you to, I'll say, bring forth your tithes and offering, but deposit them in offering plates we have at the back of the church as you, as you leave the church. And for those of you online, I would appreciate that you continue to mail in your pledges or to use our Givelify app. This is the Lord's table. The Savior invites all who want to be his friend and walk in his way to share in the feast of life that he has prepared. In memory of the Savior's love, we keep this sacred feast where every humble, contrite heart is made a welcome guest to honor Christ who walks along with us in all our days. Let grateful joy fill every mind and every voice be praised. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right in our greatest joy and duty in every time and place to give you thanks and praise. You made all that is, formed us in your image, and called your creation good. You set us in the world to love and to serve you and to live in peace with all, the whole of creation. In the fullness of time, out of your great love for the world, you sent your only Son to be one of us, the Good Shepherd, to guide us in the way of life by telling us stories and to reach out in compassion to redeem us and to heal our brokenness. And so we do praise you, joining our voices with the choirs of angels, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, to pray the song of praise, sung without ceasing by the host of heaven and the faithful of every time and place, saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. In Jesus, your word become flesh and lived among us, full of grace and truth, knowing both joy and sorrow. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, opened the blind eyes, broke bread with the outcast and sinners, and told stories of the good news of your kingdom to the poor and the needy and the desperate. On the cross, he proved himself to be the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep, given himself for the life of the world. And rising from the grave, he claimed us for victory over death. Seated at the right hand, he prays for us and leads us still as the good shepherd to eternal life. Remembering your kindness and grace toward us and all creation, we take this bread and wine and joyfully to celebrate his dying and his rising and his coming again. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice to your service, announcing with one voice the story of our faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, 
that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be our communion in the Good Shepherd, Jesus Christ. Remember your church, Presbyterian, Methodist, Lutheran, Roman Catholic, and all other communities of faith that seek to follow Jesus Christ, the sheep of his fold. Unite us in the truth of your word and empower it in ministry to the world. Remember the world of nations and every other place where there is turmoil. By your spirit, let peace and justice prevail. Remember the sick and the suffering and those whose losses and sorrows are too much to bear, as well as those whose lives have been disrupted by the pandemic. Comfort and encourage them and give hope to all who are in need or distress. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor be yours, almighty God, now and forever and to ages of ages. Amen. And hear us now as we pray the prayer Jesus taught for the coming of the kingdom of God, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread, and after giving thanks to God, broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. And every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes. With thanksgiving, let us offer God our grateful praise. The gifts of God for the people of God. For today's service, we are going to have you come down the aisle, and I would say just kind of space yourselves out I will serve you the bread um, with, the, with Tom's. Have your hand out. We'll be a little Catholic style here today. Uh, and take the bread and then go and pick up a cup out of yourselves. Pick it up out of the uh, communion tray. Uh, and then return back to your seat and have the bread and the cup there. And then leave your cup in the pew. So we think this is a best practice for us to be Table is set. The meal is ready. Please come.
Body of Christ, welcome to you. Blood of Christ shed for all of us. Let us pray. We thank you for this supper shared in the spirit with Jesus Christ, who renews us and strengthens us and brings us the hope of eternal life. Grant that we who have enjoyed the privilege of this feast and have been nourished at his table by his body and blood may be filled with him and with his joy, giving up of ourselves as he has freely given. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. what has been called one of the most beautiful doxologies of the New Testament. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to make you stand without blemish in the presence of his glory with rejoicing, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time now and forever. Amen. <laughs> 